Security bits? Huh. Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna be talking about this IBM PS1 VGA monitor here. I was recently given this thing. I have no idea if it works. I actually don't even know if it can work on its own because originally, some of you may re recognize this, but this is an IBM PS1 monitor, sort of part of a, not quite an all-in-one, but the monitor sat on top of a little computer. It all fit together perfectly. And in fact, this monitor has the power supply in it for the PS1 computer. But on its own here, I don't have the little computer. Maybe this thing can make a decent little VGA monitor. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So this monitor is certainly not the prettiest looking monitor in the world, but I really have a soft spot in my heart for small VGA type monitors. And this looks like to me, it's 12, maybe 13 inches at most. And I kind of love that. I actually don't have a single small VGA monitor in the shop here. In fact, check out the Sony one that's sitting up here on the IBM 5170. That's a multi-scan E200, which is big, 17 inches maybe took the tilt stand off the bottom because the thing is just so massive, really heavy. It's a really great monitor, but it's just so big. Sometimes I just want to use a smaller monitor, something that's a little less imposing on top of a desktop computer that just fits a little bit better. Now, the local person who gave me this monitor had no idea if this thing even works or not. And it's in rather dirty condition, although it doesn't seem like it's physically beat up. It definitely needs a deep cleaning if it works. Look at the side profile of this monitor. It's pretty big. It's got some junk in the trunk, shall we say. This big booty section here, which definitely sticks out further than you would think for a monitor of this size. In typical IBM fashion, this thing is built like a tank and is really heavy. Now, tilting the monitor up exposes the controls which are on the front here. There's a headphone jack, there's a volume slider, uh, brightness and contrast and the power switch, which kind of sticks out the front. These are all sort of recessed under the monitor here, but the fact that there is a headphone connection implies that this thing does, let me put this down, it's so heavy, that audio feeds from its original computer back into this and there must be a built-in speaker in here. Now on the back of the monitor, there are three fixed cables on here and everything is rather dirty. So I'm gonna try to bring these up here without getting my hands too filthy. We have two D sub connectors here. We have the VGA HD 15 and another 15 pin, but this time it's a female connector. And then there is a regular mains plug for North America. Now on the PS1 computer, the regular VGA cable carries the video signal. So that's all pretty standard. But this cable here is what feeds the power back into the computer. And I guess the audio from the machine into the monitor as well. So this is necessary for use with a PS1 since the monitor is giving it power. But I'm under the assumption that if I just don't connect this cable and I rely on just the VGA, that at least I can get this thing working as a standard VGA monitor. Now looking at the rest of the back of the monitor, it's flat except for this area here, which is sticks out another inch or about two and a half centimeters from this flat part. So I'm not sure what's going on here, although maybe that's part of the power supply or, or something. We're gonna crack this thing open, and take a look inside. On the IBM sticker here, 120 volts. Part number is 53F5798. There's a serial number. Manufacturing date is May 1990. On the, on the underside, there's not much to report except for this thing, which looks like a trap door. And when you flip it down, even though it can flop back and forth, it's got two little tongs here. And I assume this tilts the monitor because when this, when you push down on these little tongs, it locks this whole thing into place. So I guess this is like a negative tilt stand. With the kickstand down, it makes the monitor look strange. Like maybe it's in heat or something. I, I don't know. But the front of the screen is perpendicular pretty much to the table. So I suppose if this was sitting on top of your PS1, it would be a little better if the PS1 were not low down, but you know, up a little bit higher. So you had a better straight on view to the monitor. 
and it's stable. Like I said, when that little kickstand is pushing down the table, it locks it into place. So it's kind of a cool design. If I tilt it forward, then I can flip the kickstand easily enough and put it down. But if you tilt it forward <laughs> and you put the kickstand down and you put it down, it's locked. So even when I slide this around on the table, the kickstand won't risk falling down. So I think before I even turn this thing on, I wanna take the back cover off, just take a look inside and see if anything looks really out of the ordinary or wrong in there that could risk damaging it further if I turn it on. I'm not gonna do any cleaning of this outside of the monitor though before I know for sure that this thing works, only because if it's totally beyond repair, I don't wanna spend effort doing that work. It sort of cut my losses, so to speak, before I, I go forward with any other work on this monitor. So let me crack the back off and let's peer inside. Security bits, huh? Yeah, you heard right. IBM used security bits on the outside screws for this thing. So luckily I had that correct bit in my little tool set. So you just take out the four screws. There was a little cover on the back of the monitor. I wanted to see what that was in case there was a screw, but it wasn't. It was just a little plastic cover covering up the molding marks. There are a couple screws in the little tilt stand, which you do have to remove and pull that thing off as well. Then the back cover just lifts right off. The cables feed through the back hole. All right, well, inside the monitor, it's pretty cramped in here. Here's the speaker, which fires outside of the case. There's a fan, so that looks really dusty. Uh, I'd say this thing got a lot of use, although a lot of the dirt in here came from falling inside of the vents, because I could see it sort of piled up on top of where the vent holes were. But there definitely is a lot of dust in here from, from usage as well, especially from this fan here. This big section over here is the power supply for the monitor and the computer, combination of both. And uh, hopefully it won't mind turning on the monitor without the computer load being connected. Also, the fan is probably dead or super noisy. It would be nice just to take it out or disable it because I'm never gonna use this with a PS1 computer. And the load on the power supply will be a lot less without the computer drying on it. So it probably is fine without the fan. And the power for the fan actually comes from the motherboard PCB. Uh, it's a little tough to get to, so I, there we go, I pulled it off. So I'm just gonna leave this off entirely since I'm sure this is gonna be super loud. I have to say one thing, it's just a little bit of a pet peeve, but like there's a zip tie right here. They never even cut the excess length off here. I mean, come on. Just, what does that take? One split second to cut that, and there we go. They cut it over here. I see other areas where it's it was cut, but oh no, well not this one either though. So they cut one of them, and then they left this one right here. I'm trying to give you a better view down into the monitor, but it's pretty tight. And this board over here is the video board. The VGA cable comes in. Here's the RGB signals feed into that board. This is what processes the video, and then it goes to the neck boards. There are obviously these potentiometers right here for adjusting things. And fortunately they are completely unlabeled. Well, there are labels like VR502 and 602, but there's no actual label on what those do. But those might be the drive signals because I'm not even seeing any kind of drive adjustments on the neck board here. It's probably, this is probably the drive and the cut or bias right there. Now looking down there in the mainboard, sorry, the camera angle is not conducive to seeing it, but I see at least a uh, width coil. And also it looks like another adjustable transformer, which might be the uh, position or vertical size or something like that. Actually, I just noticed right here on the side, there are some more controls. This is for the geometry. So starting at the closest to the front of the monitor, PCC, it's probably pin cushion, something like that. Vertical size, vertical center, vertical frequency. So that would be I guess for adjusting like vertical hold, basically. Uh, V-line, horizontal frequency, so that's horizontal hold. And then the last control on the end here is horizontal phase, so that is the horizontal position. So that def definitely leads to what I was thinking that these two controls on the board down there are for vertical size and horizontal size. And I am trying to see what the label says on the CRT, but unfortunately, just due to the way that this uh, metal construction is on the monitor, it is impossible to see. The metal is very close to the, the label. I can just see that it's made in Taiwan, but that's about it. When looking at the main PCB with a flashlight, I found two more controls down there. You can see mode three V size and mode two V size. You can also just make out a Samsung logo and name under some wires just to the left of those controls. 
In addition, on the side of the monitor, there are cutouts in the metal for access to the flyback transformer so you can adjust focus and the screen brightness. So I now have the monitor connected to the mains voltage. It's not plugged into any computers though. Let's see what happens when we turn it on. Hey, it degaussed, powered up. I hear high voltage. So this is all good signs. I, I have a feeling this thing is going to generate a picture. I just have the uh, brightness and the contrast set in the middle here. Okay, there we go. There is definitely image. I'm rather surprised that the sliders aren't even that scratchy, which is quite amazing. And who knows, is this a typical for IBM monitors? I've never owned an IBM monitor. Do they show white like this when there's no input signal? Is that normal for these or not? The VGA monitors, that is. Hmm. For a VGA signal, I'm gonna use this Acer Aspire 1. Remember these, these netbooks here? This thing has Windows XP on it. What I like about it is it has VGA output and it still works perfectly with Windows XP. So it's kind of perfect for trying to drive these old monitors. Let's just connect this up to the side here. Actually, let me make sure all the pins are straight. Yes, everything looks good there. Oh, it says IBM right here on the VGA connector. Let's connect this up. It's normal that there's no signal yet. Um, the computer's still detecting the monitor. I heard it make the beep beep sound. And I'm just gonna switch this from internal display to external display. All right, well, it's working except um, Clearly one of the issues is it is driving the monitor at too high <laughs> of a frequency. So I would assume this thing is probably only good for 640 by 480, possibly, oh, nice, it reverted back to the laptop, possibly 800 by 600 at 60 Hertz, something like that. So unfortunately the drivers are just not gonna let me drive a monitor 640 by 480. So this little netbook, as useful as I thought it was, is not useful enough, I'm gonna have to hook up to one of my PCs down here, which could drive this thing at the native resolution. This DOS machine down here is my favorite mini tower machine. It's a Pentium MMX 200. And I love this machine, it has a 360K floppy drive. I use this thing pretty much the most of any of my old retro PCs, especially because I can slow it down to around a 386 speed, thanks to stuff I found on Phil's computer lab. Anyhow, normally this is plugged into a KVM and is connected to this monitor and this keyboard. So what I did is I unplugged the VGA cable from the back and I plugged this IBM monitor directly into this machine. So when I turn it on here, we should get an image, maybe. There it is. So the brightness control is actually all the way down right now. So that's why that looks not so great. And there it is all the way up. Turn it back to a reasonable level. And the contrast, okay, there it is all the way down and all the way up. Oh, okay. Now you saw the Windows 98 logo as this thing booted up, but if I go into Windows 98, it's not gonna work because I have uh, high resolution settings on Windows 98 for my other monitor. So that definitely isn't gonna work. So I'm gonna try one of these games here and we will see how those look. And there is Doom. Most excellent. I gotta say this thing looks uh, pretty good actually. I feel like every time I get a VGA monitor lately, it's very worn out. The problem with VGA monitors is that they were usable for quite a long time. You could still use an old VGA monitor with a PC that was relatively new and modern. You could basically use it until you wanted an LCD or it died and then you bought an LCD. And since CRTs are consumable items, if someone kept using it until the CRT was so worn out that it was really hard to use, then, you know, they're not going to work very well today, right? And that's that's my biggest issue with a lot of CRTs that that you find these days. I have gone and bought stuff off of uh, say Craigslist for you know cheap, but people said, oh, works great. I get it home. It's worn out. It has burn in. It's, it's fuzzy. The image is just not good. Sorry, I'm not really paying attention while I'm playing here. So, you know, it's like I said, it's just hard to find good VGA monitors. So this one is not bad, not bad at all. I'm gonna say the only issue I noticed with this is, the, I'd say that the uh, cutoffs are probably not adjusted quite perfectly because uh, it's so dark in this part of the screen, darker than I really remember it being. In fact, the Sony monitor that's sitting on top of the IBM here, it doesn't render this dark section as dark as this one does. The image is pretty good, it's pretty bright. The colors are quite vibrant and I know that doesn't necessarily come across in the camera. Looking at this information screen for Doom here, it's, it's, the monitor is not the sharpest monitor in the world, that's for sure. And I don't know, maybe this was never that good in the first place since it's a pretty low res monitor, but it would be nicer if it was sharper. 
Although at this point, the fact is this monitor seems to work quite well. I haven't noticed any issues with it. So it deserves a really good deep cleaning and some calibration. And that might cl clean up and sharpen up this image quite a bit. So at this point, I think what I wanna do is take this thing apart further and give it a nice good cleaning. The clean, do you hear that? I'm getting some static on the volume on the, out of the speaker. Uh, oh, it's the volume pot, it's very scratchy. <laughs> okay, anyways, I think what I'm gonna do is take this monitor apart further and give it a nice deep cleaning, the cleaning that it deserves. There's a lot of schmutz around, um, oh, the video cable probably fell off the back of the computer. There's a lot of schmutz around the edge of the screen here, just stuff is falling in there. So I think it'd be best if I just take the CRT out and then I can really give this thing a nice deep cleaning. So disassembly time. In trying to take the monitor apart, it turns out that the front bezel needs to come off first. So there are four screws around that bezel. The CRT is mounted to the chassis behind it. Next, I take off the power switch and the controls, the front controls and the headphone jack. With everything free, the front bezel simply lifts away. Although watch out because the power LED is actually screwed into the front and needs to be removed. Now it's time to give the monitor a good clean. It's just so dirty, it doesn't come across in the camera, but it felt so good to clean it. I took it outside and I used compressed air to blow the a massive amount of dust out of it. Sorry for the out of focus camera footage. I had the focus locked on the camera. Dope. I don't show this on camera, but I took the back cover and the front bezel and I gave it a good wash in my utility sink and I let it dry overnight. So now it looks all clean. Before reassembly, it's time to put deoxid into the front controls because we all know the volume is a bit scratchy. Of course, you move it back and forth quite a bit. I also did the same to the power switch. I gave the monitor a little bit of a wipe down on the inside, just a little bit of Windex on a paper towel. I just like things looking clean. Watch out if you do this, make sure the CRT is fully discharged and unplugged first. Some of the wires were a little bit messy looking. These are the sync wires from the VGA cable. So I just wanted to give them a few zip ties and keep them away from the flyback transformer. I'm putting the speaker back on here, even though it's not gonna be used. I just wanted to have it there and the back stabilizer bar. The CRT is looking so nice and clean and it just makes me happy. Before the bezel goes on, I gotta reinstall the LED. The front bezel goes on before the controls are reattached to the chassis. So you just have to move those out of the way and then put the four screws into the corners. And then you can reattach all of the front controls and the headphone jack. Two of the controls that are available on the top side of the PCB, like the width coil, are actually visible and accessible from the bottom side of the monitor. So I'm marking them with a Sharpie to more easily find them. And we're done. Put the monitor down and it reminds me of how ridiculously heavy this is. Well, the monitor is back together. It's all cleaned up inside. And I did a few things I just want to talk about really quick. So there are only two cords coming out of the back right now because I removed the power cord that goes to the, the PS1 computer. Now I didn't cut anything or damage anything. So if I ever get a PS1 computer and I say want to use this monitor with it, I can just reinstall this cord. And for now there will just be a blank hole in the back of the monitor, but it's uh, it's no big deal, it's not dangerous. There's nothing in there that you could touch accidentally. And I just rather not have this thick cord banging around in, uh, off the back of the monitor. And the other thing I took out was the fan. So this was the original fan that was in there, kind of noisy and not so great. So I took it off the bracket, which is reinstalled. And I cut the cable, as you notice, there's no cable on here, just a little, a little bit of length left. And I reinstalled the connector and it is right here. There's heat shrink tubing on the end. And I just left that in there. So if I ever do reinstall a fan in here, I can buy a much quieter one like a Noctua, reinstall it in this bracket here and attach it to the, the connector. And we are all good. The speaker is hooked up and it's reinstalled even though it doesn't go anywhere. So I think at this point, I need to plug this in, let it warm up and hook it up to a computer and then put some test patterns through it so I can start adjusting things. So the monitor is all warmed up at this point and I want to start fiddling with the controls to adjust the geometry. It actually was really quite good uh, right out of the box, but I'd like to make the picture wider and taller than it is now. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is use this little plastic adjustment tool. And I wish I knew what these were called when it came to ordering these say off DigiKey, maybe an alignment tool. I've had this for years. I don't even know where I got this, 
but this is the type of tool you need to adjust those with coils. There's a bit of an Allen key thing going on and it's plastic, it has to be plastic. If you try to put a metal Allen key in those with coils when the monitor is powered up, it's not a good thing, bad things will happen. So I'm just gonna widen this picture up. I'm running Check It here. I have the brightness turned up on purpose so I can see the raster. So I'm just trying to reduce the, the black bars on the side here. I was having a hard time getting my hand inside the monitor and I actually, I touched my knuckle on something that was high voltage that was exposed. So it gave me a little bit of a, of a zap. I think it was the deflection, horizontal deflection. Uh, it seems like there's just a, not a whole lot of range for this adjustment. I can make it smaller. So there, the picture is shrinking. I'm not sure how visible that is because there's a lot of turns on this thing, but I can't really make it, that's it. That is, that right there is about as wide as it can get. So that's, uh, that's annoying. I guess it's just, that's just the way this monitor is. It's not really, um, it's just not really designed to make the, the overall active picture area that large. So regular VGA monitors like this, this is not super VGA, just regular VGA, there's three different scan modes this operates in. The most common is 640 by 400. It runs at 70 Hertz. It's what text mode runs at, that, that's a 720 by 400, but essentially it's 400 lines and it is 70 Hertz. And I think um, that's what we're in right now. Oh no, this is not what we're in right now. This is one of the other modes, which is EGA, which is 640 by 350 lines, I think at 60 Hertz. And then there's one more mode, which is 640 by 480. And on this monitor, there are three controls for the vertical size for each of the modes. There's mode one, mode two, and mode three. Now the mode one control is actually on the side here with these adjustments, but the other two um, height adjustments are the little potentiometers that are inside the monitor on the PCB. Very hard to get to, and you can also not get to them from the bottom. There's no hole in the PCB to allow you to put an alignment tool in from the bottom crappy design on IBM's part or whoever designed this monitor. So I think the mode one, which is the control on the side here, is the EGA mode. And yep, you see it's actually adjusting uh, this mode. Now I shrunk it down and if I hit enter here, there we go. Notice that the, the height is different on this mode. And if I turn this adjustment here, nothing happens at all. And same goes for like this mode here, which is the 640 by 720. Again, the adjustment here does nothing. So in the EGA mode, I'm gonna use a ruler and measure the distance here from the edge of the screen to the, the lines here, the vertical line. And it's about uh, one and a half centimeters. And on this side, okay, so the monitor needs to be moved that way. First, I'm gonna adjust that. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the measurement that's on the sides here, and I'm going to try to adjust the V size so it has exactly the same measurement. The horizontal phase, H phase, is the control on the side here. And this is shared between all three modes. So I need to adjust it here for uh, evenness. Then I go check the other two modes to make sure it's similarly even. It may move around slightly and I just need to kind of split the difference. So right now, the problem I'm running into is the vertical phase, the, the position of the screen isn't quite right. The picture is actually shifted up towards the top of the screen a little bit. There's a control for V center right here on the side of the monitor. I can at least center the, the overall picture and try to get this even. Okay, we're still in EGA mode, but I've switched to one with a blue background so I can more accurately measure where the pixels start because this bottom one, it has a line as opposed to letter. So the blue background is what I'm gonna be measuring against. And there we go, I'm very happy with that. Now, if I switch over to the next mode, it's just this one, 640 by 480. Uh, I'd like to stretch it a little more. It seems like the border is a bit too big on the top and the bottom now. Now, believe it or not, the border is actually relatively even all the way around, but I'd just like to stretch it a little bit on the vertical size. But yeah, of course, uh, this is one of the controls that's deep in the monitor there. So I'm gonna have to try to get a tool on there and um, figure out how to adjust it. And this is what I came up with here. So it's a non-conductive ceramic Phillips head on the end <laughs> attached to this uh, thing with some blue painter's tape. And it's, um, pretty, it's pretty stiff. So that, that should do the trick. I can get down in there and adjust that tool. Oh, okay, I think I'm on the pot here. There it is, look at that. Ha <laughs> ha, yes. 
All right, I think I'm pretty much happy with that. I mean, there's no way to get this perfect because each of the different modes has slightly different position and I can't make the picture wider. I'd like to make it wider and I can't. So I just kind of have to eyeball it and think, okay, that looks fine. And finally, we have the 640 by 400, the 70 Hertz mode, which again, I think feels too shrunk. And it's the other adjustment that's down and under there in the monitor. Let me get it on here. This is right next to the high voltage anode cap. Like I'm talking, uh, it's touching it right now. So luckily this whole thing is non-conductive. Oh, too much. Okay, I think I'm happy with that. Let's uh, exit out of the, this mode here. Back to text mode. There we go, there's text mode. And yeah, okay. I think I've reduced the border a little bit because it just seemed egregiously big originally on this monitor. Now using this 640 by 480 grid, I'm gonna adjust the focus control on the uh, flyback transformer. It's the top control, just to see if I can sharpen this up a little bit. So that's a lot fuzzier. I don't know if that comes across in the camera, but it's blurry there. And, and it goes past, it's now blurry again. So. Yep, this monitor was pretty much adjusted as good as it could get, and it's just not that sharp of a CRT. When adjusting focus, you should look over here in the corners, and you should look in the center and just balance it out. A monitor like this probably has dynamic focus, which means the focus voltage changes slightly as it scans through, because there's a longer path for the beam to travel to hit over here than in the center, right? So it's gonna to need to vary. So usually monitors like this do have a dynamic focus, and I think top to bottom potentially do. Uh, so they, they maintain relatively even focus all the way across, but generally just sort of look to the corner and the center and adjust it as best as possible for both. So I've gone ahead and turned off the overhead lights and I've turned the contrast all the way down. I've turned the brightness up so I see the raster here. And I'm just gonna adjust some of these controls here to see what they do. So you notice this one is adjusting the kind of the background light gray color. You wanna just make it so you just see that um, the gray in the raster and the contrast is all the way down. So that's, we're still seeing a, a bit of an image there. But yeah, this, this controls that, that's the green. Uh, this is, these are the controls on the front here. So this is probably gonna be red, green, and blue. Yep, that's, that one is the red and this one will be Blue, yep, okay, that's the blue. And then these other three controls are gonna be the drive controls probably. Okay, they are having an effect, but they're having an effect on the white part of the screen. So if I turn up the contrast here and turn the brightness down, you'll see that it will be changing the way this looks here. So I'm gonna kind of give this thing an alignment. This is, you gotta do, go back and forth. <laughs> I don't know, I'm calling it alignment. Um, I found that the white part of the text was a bit too yellowy color for my taste, a little bit less blue than I'd like, although the, the, the gray on the background looked okay. So, so you kind of have to go back and forth between having the brightness turned up all the way, like, like this, just at the very edge where you can just start to see it, which is why you gotta have the lights off, and you adjust the three controls closer to the front, which is the bias controls. And then the three controls for the drive will be adjusting the text, the white text here, the color of that, and they do affect each other. So you kind of have to go back and forth and keep adjusting it. Now I have to say, I'm very pleased with the way this monitor turned out. The colors are vibrant. They are bright and they're vibrant. Not all VGA CRTs can claim that um, characteristic, probably because they use phosphor that's just not as high quality, or maybe the shadow mask is much denser, so there's less light getting to your eyes. Not sure, but this thing, like looking at this text here, it looks bright, it's relatively sharp. I mean, it's not a high resolution CRT, but it's pretty sharp. I mean, it's very readable and the pixels are very easy to make out, and the colors, they just look great. And from a uniformity perspective, everything looks good too. I don't have any weird like color blotches or anything. This monitor has a working degauss. I can hear it when I first turn it on, and uh, it seems to be effective because everything is looking good. Green looks great. Blue is vibrant blue color. It looks fantastic. And I think I'm ready to put the case back together. There's not too much to putting the case back together, but just slide the back cover on and it kind of falls into place. 
And then you have to reinstall the little kickstand, which has two screws. Then you have to install the five screws with the security bit. So make sure you have that handy. And now it's back together. One final touch up and clean with Magic Eraser and some Windex just to make the thing look perfect. I honestly couldn't be happier how this monitor turned out. It looks fantastic now. I mean, other than the, the strange way the monitor looks from the factory, at least now it's incredibly clean and what really blows my mind, I don't see any scratches on this thing at all. It really has no blemishes that I can tell. It's a shame I don't have the original PS1 that goes with this, but it's not the end of the world because that computer's not super useful. I think the fastest configuration was a 486DX266, but a lot of them are 286s and 386s and stuff like that. So, oh well, I have, I have other PCs that are perfectly good that will work great with this monitor. Now I had mentioned this briefly earlier about the size of this screen. I thought it was maybe 12 inches or potentially 13. Well, with a ruler up to the glass, it's actually a bit over 11. And um, underneath the bezel, it is a 12 inch VGA CRT that's in here. So pretty small, which is pretty cool. The lack of a swivel stand on here is a little bit of an annoyance, but you might've seen me use this thing before on the channel. And this is a Tandy, although it was sold under various names, tilt swivel stand that is perfect for putting under monitors that don't have one built in. Now with the odd shape of this monitor, it might be a bit hard to use this thing, but I'm gonna try. I think most of the weight is up at the front anyways, where the glass is. So let's see how this works on this tilt swivel stand. Well, I'm gonna say that that tilt swivel stand works flawlessly with this monitor. It's not perfect, the monitor is a little smaller than the width of the stand as you see there, but hey, that's no big deal. When you're looking at it from the front, you won't even notice that. And this gives you the ability to move the screen around without too much difficulty. If you're looking for one of these tilt swivel stands yourself, I can't even really tell you what to search for on eBay. I think I found one just called tilt swivel stand. I paid like $15 shipped and um, it's pretty amazing. I have to say, I love this. These were really common back in the old days for this exact purpose and Radio Shack obviously sold them. They did not make them, but they sold them. So you might find them under different brands, but yeah, look for this particular one. Uh, it's a pretty good stand and it works great with a lot of monitors. For me, the final step after working on any CRT is to just use it because sometimes there are maybe faults inside like an arcing flyback transformer or other issues that you may not notice after just running it a few minutes. So it's good to put it through its paces. So here I am, I have it hooked up to my Pentium 200 machine there and I'm just running some various games on it and spending a good amount of time with it, warming up the CRT and just enjoying it. I know I've already mentioned this, but the colors on this screen just pop. They're bright, vibrant, and very pleasing to look at. And honestly, the small size of it makes 320 by 200 games or 320 by 240 games like these actually seem a little less chunky than they are normally. Because when you play them on a big monitor like that Sony I have, the pixels are just so large and square. So it's kind of nice to see them at a much smaller reduced size. So if you happen to come across one of these IBM PS1 monitors and you don't have the computer, rest assured that you can use this on any of your PCs up to 640 by 480 and it makes a great little monitor. And with that, I'm gonna end this video here. From a monitor that I had no idea if it even worked, filthy, dirty thing, to something that looks really nice and works really well, I couldn't be happier. And I know I seem to do a lot of CRT monitor videos lately, but I just love the way CRTs look. I mean, don't get me wrong, on modern computers, I don't wanna use anything but a nice high resolution, high refresh rate LCD. But when it comes to retro computers, for some reason, I just really enjoyed the way it looks coming out of that glass screen with that glow of the phosphor and the, the flicker of the refresh rate. Something about it is just sort of magical to me and brings me back to the old days. So if you like this video, you know what to do. If you didn't, you know what to do as well. And you know, all the usual YouTube stuff and that's gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.